So hi, we're back again. It's uh, me, John Tilt, and uh, Tom from Winning Performance. We're going to talk about your latest blog, Tom, which is uh, about improving deadlift speed off the floor. Yep. Going to take you through a number of aspects, but uh, a couple of things I, I pulled out right from the start. Um, go lighter to go stronger oh. and stop grinding out reps. Oh. Do you want to start there? Yeah, we can do. Go lighter to go stronger. I think one of the biggest things athletes, clients of mine have a problem with is weight selection. I think too many people grind reps out. So there's the concept of different strength qualities. So you've got speed strength and strength speed. Um, if you're grinding a rep out, if you think of how long that, that lift takes concentrically, so let's stick with the deadlift, grinding the rep from the floor and it takes five seconds for you to finish it at lockout, as opposed to finishing the lift in under a second. Think of the extra fatigue you're now putting on your body. And with the deadlift, it is, it's the most draining for the nervous system. So you add, add that into grinding reps out. It, it means people just, they don't get progress. And I was guilty of it when I first started training the deadlift. I didn't know, nobody knows what they're doing. Everyone's a beginner at some point. Mm -hmm. And I remember deadlifting one week and it'll be good. And then you're like, right, I'm just gonna put five kilos on the next week. And you can't do it because the rep quality, the rep speed, isn't there. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice in the program that the, on the neural days that we, or I, I write in tempo. But a lot of the time with my clients, they'll have tempo one week, as in they'll lift the bar, I'll ask them to control it five seconds down, pause, lift it again. The next week, they'll have eccentric less tempo. So they'll be able to lift the bar, drop it straight down, lift the bar, drop it straight down so there's no eccentric tension whatsoever and a lot of people they only train with an uh, eccentric -less deadlift mm -hmm. okay there's even one person promoting the fact that it is an eccentric -less lift and i think that's i just think you limit yourself when you say when you make comments like that you're taking out a whole element uh, of the lift that you can use to your advantage to progress Okay. Um, but go lighter to go stronger. People are just basically picking too heavy a weight. When you do that, the, not only do you lead to fatigue, which can then lead to, to a plateau week to week, um, but also your, rep, your repetition quality breaks down, your technique breaks down. Mm -hmm. So by people trying to go too heavy too often, um, they get fatigued. Just because you can lift it doesn't mean you should, which is another, another thing I use or say to clients. But the, the, grinding a rep, you should save for over 90% of your 1RM. And if you apply that rule or principle to every lift, you tend to get better progress. 90% is that sweet spot, regardless of the lift. You can only stay at 90% for two, maybe three weeks. Uh, or over 90% over for two, maybe three weeks. Mm -hmm. um, but 90% is that sweet spot. You can use um, different units to measure bar speed. And then I can okay. get really specific. We've got one here. It's called push band or whatever. Uh, and I can measure bar speed of every lift, or you can just get used to feeling and seeing how a lift looks. Yeah. Um, so no breakdown, no change in speed from floor floor to uh, to stand up. But yeah, go lighter to go stronger is something that most people don't get. Just because you can lift doesn't mean you do. Um, technique has to be there. Maximum intent has to be there still. Um, so yeah, it's something I definitely espouse for the deadlift. But perhaps not the, the strain on the face and the, yeah. the looking like you're lifting hard. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, yeah save, save that for your competition, you want our end days. Mm -hmm. Everything else should be building up, working on, on different qualities. Okay. Eddie Cohn, who is a fantastic powerlifter, he's known as the, the GOAT, the greatest of all time with regard to powerlifting, and he says you've only got so many 1RMs in you. So mm -hmm. well, don't don't try to hit a one of them every week. Save it, build up to it, and then hit it, and okay. then allow things to happen. Yeah, that sounds sounds good sense. So take you back a couple of steps. Just uh, obviously, this whole article is about the deadlift. Can you explain the basics of it and, and why it's a good lift for me? The basics of the deadlift is bend down, pick bar up. It's really that simple. Mm -hmm. um, why is it good for you or anybody? Um, it involves such a huge amount of musculature that it's very bang for your buck, as my mentor, late mentor Charles, used to say. So if you if you're stuck for time, you don't know what to do. Deadlift might be might be a good idea because it works so much of your your musculature from from 
feet all the way up to, to grip traps absolutely everything gets a little bit of tension mm -hmm. um, it's very realistic with regards to life life uh, life events how often do you have to bend down and pick something up quite a lot yeah so <laughs> it's good to, it's good to understand the, the, the right mechanics for that mm -hmm. um, so yeah I mean it's very bang for your buck and it, it, it's applicable to probably everyone all the way up to uh, you know older individuals who may struggle more to pick things up the floor and comparison with say a squat would it um, is it more beneficial or different aspects there's no I'm no there's a more beneficial as an opinion there mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't say one's better than the other unless I had a specific case study in more context um, I think everyone should squat everyone should deadlift um, they don't necessarily have to deadlift a specific way or they, they have to progress into it but everyone should do a hip hinge movement and a and a knee or hip hip dominant movement where, where you're squatting down they're two different things because you wouldn't squat to pick up a heavy box if you tried squatting down to pick up a heavy box you wouldn't be able to pick it up that way you have to bend over at the at the waist you have to hinge at the hips a little bit so that they don't necessarily transfer to each other okay natural fact they, they, there's a saying so if you can if you can squat heavy you might or you probably have the potential to deadlift heavy but not the other way around okay right thank you so the key aspects of the lift, um, reading through your, your blog, technique, looking at the weakest link, and speed, which you've already touched on. Mm. Now, elaborate a little on those three areas. So, so technique. technique, obviously this is, is difficult on a, on a podcast, um, but the biggest technique problem I think people have is their hips move first. Okay, so if you imagine you, you've got everything lined up, let's say you, you know the middle of your foot's under the bar, shoulders uh, are over the bar mm -hmm. or above the bar, um, and then when clients or students, athletes lift, what happens is their shoulders go in front of the bar, and this is indicative of the hips rising first. So the best way to figure out if you're doing this, and again, I've had clients, and I just I take I tell them to, to video from the side, slow it down so you can just slowly move the video monitor. And you can see what moves first does your upper back rise to the ceiling first or do your hips rise to the ceiling first mm -hmm. what you'll see is if people's uh, hips rise they fall over the bar so if your hips rise something's got to give because obviously your shoulders are connected yeah. so the shoulders end up in front of the bar and then what happens there is you're therefore putting more stress on your discs and your lower back and it's not uh, conducive to lifting maximal weight so the biggest technique problem people have is hips rise first as do upper back rising first okay and then analyzing that weakest link finding that weakest link in the chain how would you go about that use the 5050 five, mm. tempo mm -hmm. so do do sets of five and use the tempo five seconds up five seconds down whatever breaks down first will give you an idea so if you do five seconds up and your hips start to rise too early it may be that you're not getting enough leg drive maybe you're not activating enough quad maybe it's just technique a lot of people look for weaknesses in muscle groups and it's just look your, your technique is just poor your weakest link is your technique so find a good coach and, and look at that sometimes there isn't a fix sometimes it's like well what lift is going to get my deadlift up I'm deadlifting better mm -hmm. you know hence this the speed work and i know we're going to get to that uh, later um so you do the five seconds up and then on the way down your hips tuck under and you're rounding your back well it would indicate that the, the erectile spine you know, eccentrically aren't strong I know you're going to get people argue that you don't always have to lower it down but you want to be able to lower down what you can pick up uh, for safety and again longevity purposes mm -hmm. so we come to speed now mm -hmm. the uh, probably the key aspect because that's the the whole gist of the article yes especially with this to, to, to pull something off the floor quickly you have to be able to activate things quickly so the deadlift one of the one of the best aspects and one of the reasons it's the most draining on your nervous system is you have to overcome inertia you have to overcome a dead stop so in a squat you walk it out from the rack you're already loading your muscles eccentrically and then you get to bounce out the bottom and the deadlift you don't get that you don't get that luxury okay so speed work is uh, is something that definitely helps uh, overall obviously deadlift speed but deadlift performance even maximally mm -hmm. uh, the guy i would look at uh, as being the biggest proponent or the first proponent of this is louis simmons of westside barber and you would do 
a heavy day, and then what I refer to as a speed or IMC, an intermuscular coordination day. I refer to it as that is because there's different ways of enhancing speed than rather than just accommodating resistance. I know I didn't elaborate on them in that article, but sometimes it's too much. Um, but you would, the biggest benefit to the speed day is you get to deadlift again. Mm -hmm. And if you're gonna get better at something or if you're gonna become good at something, everyone talks about the 10,000 perfect reps. Okay, so would you be better doing it once a week or twice a week? And you can't deadlift heavy twice a week, so you get to do it with speed, which is lighter. And again, you can practice technique. Um, and it's the, the key is having to overcome inertia quickly. So a lot of people, they're not used to deadlifting and turning on immediately. So with a deadlift, you have to turn it on like that. There's no loading of the muscles and then bouncing out. You have to be able to turn everything on at the same time and then lift the bar up. So speed work helps train uh, the ability for you to coordinate all of your muscles uh, and contract hard and fast. So from my world of track running, it would probably equate very well to a sprint start. Yes. So that it's sort of explosive, out of the box, very, very, very yes. fast. Okay. It would definitely be one of the ones. Um, there's gonna be different angles involved. It may be that, I'd have to look at the angle you start at and your, your hip. Uh, angle but yeah we might you might need to raise it a little bit but it would definitely be of benefit to consider within a block or a cycle that speed deadlift could be good for you interesting principles okay um on your blog you actually have a, a really good video of a, of a guy i think you've nicknamed the beast i didn't i didn't nickname him. <laughs> he, he, he stole he, it for he himself. himself yeah yeah um he demonstrates three different lifts and mm. clearly has different speeds would you is yeah you so the video we're talking about is eddie hall and the the you can find it on youtube you can watch his build up to the 500 kilo deadlift the three lifts he did include in that so the 500 kilo deadlift being his maximal the one he did before was around 465 466 and then the one he did before that was 420 and if you look at the speed difference between the three if you look at it the 420 the, just the reaction of the crowd, and I think you said the commentator were just like, what? They were just in absolute awe and shock that somebody could move 420 that quickly. And I think that reaction probably helped Eddie um, because it would have given him like, oh my God, the crowd are excited. It felt good, boom, next lift. Mm -hmm. He made 465 or 466, whatever it was, look equally as easy. It didn't slow down that much. Mm -hmm. 500 was a different animal. He had to obviously work through it. But again, I, I spoke about in the article, speed quality. Eddie didn't train the way that I've laid out. He trained uh, differently. If you look at it, I don't think he used accommodate resistance, but he was a proponent of deadlifting heavy every other week. Um, but he would always deadlift with a maximal intent regardless. So he would treat 300 kilos the way he treated the 500 kilos. He would attack it like that. And that's the other, that's the key technique point on the speed day that people forget. So on your, your, your speed, your dynamic deadlift day, each rep is practicing one RM. So even though there's probably between 40 and 60% of weight of your one RM on the bar. So if you deadlift 200 kilos, it could be what 80 to 120 on the bar, plus a bit of chain weight. Even though it's only 40 to 60% of your one RM, you have to believe it is 200 kilos. You have to believe it's the, that. And I think that's one of the things Eddie was really good at, besides him being amazing technically. But he would deadlift um, with speed. I don't believe he deadlifted over 90% of the buildup. Okay. I think he talks about he did 450 and again it looked quick and he said when he did that uh, in that session and the speed it went up he just knew at that point that was it mm -hmm. he, he's got it in the bag he didn't need to go over and do 501 kilos or whatever he just needed to lift a little bit lighter deload peak and he knew he was going to get it and what I found interesting from the video is that you're talking about ways of measuring the speed of the bar it's obvious when you look at it mm. that there are different speeds when he's going up and mm. you know you don't need sophisticated equipment to tell you that that no. bar was moving faster mm. uh, when he was doing the lighter weights yeah um, no it was, it was um, very impressive excellent okay so um, where do I start what I'm, I'm starting out and I want to increase the speed Hire a, good coach. <laughs> hire, a, hire a good coach is always a good point. Find yeah. a good coach. Find someone that's done it, been there, seen it, done it. Um, where do you start? Um, I mean, if, you, if you're just starting out, you should you should be, it's technique, technique, technique. Don't worry about loading heavy weights on the bar. 
find a program that works around five to eight reps and just get better in that rep range and you can you can progress quite you can pro- progress linearly mm-hmm. for quite a period of time if you're just starting out you don't need to do the speed day you need to just get better at everything basically um, if you've been doing it for maybe one or two years and you're looking to get into the strength game um, then yeah you might want to look at in, including the second day but if you're just starting out it's a case of just get stronger in or get better at the movement pattern and get stronger in the posterior chain movements or the back center movements mm-hmm. a, a couple of techniques that you talk about are the the knee bounce and the yeah. leg drive yeah do you want to expand more on those sure so i didn't know this until i read andy bolton's book and i think it's dynamite deadlift he wrote with pavel satsuma as a co-joint book and in there pavel uh, talks about a russian study by a guy named jekov and the fact that uh, using a knee bounce is almost like an elastic response so when i when i mean knee bounce it's kind of you, you, your knees are away from the bar so your feet are static you bring your knees away and then you kind of bounce your knees into the lift mm-hmm. um, if you watch andy bolton do it he does like usually you see him do three ramps so he'll knee bounce once just to get tight get a little squeeze on the bar you'll see the bar tension just lift up a little bit then he'll do it again and on the third one he hits it and goes so that that movement has been shown to be stronger than just trying to lift it from a dead stop okay. when i use that with 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 athletes and again what it does is it helps avoid the biggest problem that clients athlete students have which is the the hips rising first mm-hmm. if you bounce your knees into the bar your hips are already on a downward trajectory okay so when you bounce the knees in the bar and you, you perform the lift because your hips are on the way down, your upper back can go on the way up. Mm-hmm. So it helps timing wise. Because it is a new technique, you just need to spend a lot of time doing it. So the more times you do it, if you do it on the neural day, day, the speed day, the better you're gonna get at it. And I find that people find that they can, I had an Irish client, she's a powerlifter, jun- junior, I think she's 15 and she put, <laughs> in just one outing, 20 kilos and I want her in deadlift. And she'd already been training with me for, for three to six months, but she, she flew over, I was able to do a tutorial with her, and boom, it made a huge difference to her lifts mm-hmm. because she wasn't getting over the bar and therefore knees uh, locking out too early and being able to use more hip musculature and being able to use more weight, uh, move more weight. Okay. And from what I remember, the, the second video, I think, really demonstrated that technique really well. Yes, yeah, so the, sec- the second video was Andy Bolton ramping up, and then the mm. third video, as we were talking about leg drive, is, is Tom Martin. And he does a similar thing where he kind of he doesn't do three ramps, he kind of does maybe one or two and then gets into it. But he, he, he's able to get, if you watch him from the side, leg drive is all about being able to use a bit more quad, in my opinion. Um, and it means you need to allow your knees to be either above the bar or maybe even a little bit in front of the bar, depending on your limb length. Now this doesn't suit everyone, and I'm not a proponent of you have to use this technique, but if you can uh, allow the knees to go in front and keep your hips down, you're gonna use more quad drive. And if you watch Tom Martin do it, I mean, he takes about 200 kilos of, or maybe more slack out of the bar, just as he tenses up. You can see the bar literally bend and whip and sometimes come off the floor if it's his uh, opening weights. But um, if you watch him from the side, his knees go in front a little bit and he's able to use more quad, which again, keeps his hips down. Um, Eddie Hall talks about, don't think about, and this isn't just Eddie Hall, there's many proponents of this. Don't think about lifting the bar, think about pushing the earth away, which is why he would always uh, utilize heavy leg presses. He said the heavy leg press transferred really well just to his mind muscle connection. So maybe he was on the leg press and he was visualizing, you know, pushing away whilst, uh, deadlifting instead of thinking it's a leg press. That's interesting. So, so you're probably not engaging your arms and shoulders so much in yeah. that. In, in that. It, yeah, I mean, it might be because he's got to, got to hold himself into position. Mm-hmm. But um, he would he definitely utilised the leg press, and I believe he attributed it uh, to, to improving his leg drive off the floor. So with a deadlift, think of pushing the bar, pushing the floor away, okay. as opposed to lifting if you think of that you tend to use legs quads hips a bit more yeah. as opposed to just trying to strain with your, your upper back and lower back mm-hmm. oh, really good okay thank you strength curve mm-hmm. is something you talk about um, mm-hmm. which my understanding is that sort of whole combination of the the chain of muscles yeah. 
So that you've got ascending and descending strength curves. The, the, the thing I was uh, trying to get at within the article was too many people only use one strength curve. They just deadlift, deadlift up, deadlift down. So if you think of a deadlift, when you're standing at the top, how difficult is it? Pretty, pretty there's, no, there's no tension. There's tension all going downwards through your hands and your traps, but there's yeah. not a lot of tension on your lower back at that point. Um, your lower back is, is complete the movement. Mm -hmm. Your lower back's got a lot of tension at the bottom when your hips are at maybe 90, and then nothing when, when your uh, hips are at zero or 180. Um, so what I was trying to allude to in that is people need to use back extensions more, uh, more hip extension movement. Number one, to create traction, which create, creates decompression in the spine. So again, it helps, you, uh, long, helps your longevity within the sport. But if you look at a back extension, like a flat back extension, your feet are clamped in, you're all the way out, your hips are at 90 degrees, so you're, you're, you're the, your head's near the floor. When you raise yourself up, now there's tension going through your posterior chain, uh, similar to when you'd be, a similar position when you'd be standing up, but there's actually tension going through your, your uh, lower back, posterior chain, glutes, hamstrings and whatever. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's a case of, if you get strong throughout the full strength curve, if you get strong in back extensions, reverse hyper extensions, incline back extensions, uh, glute ham raises, you are going to be way more conditioned to deadlift heavier weights. Okay. It's one of the things Charles says, I think he got it from maybe Stuart McGill. Uh, you can train the lower back every every four days, four to five days, but tra train it with a different strength curve. You deadlifts on Monday, you could do reverse hypers on uh, Thursday, Friday, then you could do so on and so forth. Okay, makes sense. The program is in the blog in, in great detail. We don't need to go through it line by line here. Um, but I'd like you to expand on some of the things. So there are there are two types of day. There's yeah. the, the neural and the IMC. Yeah. Would you like to explain the neural first? Neural yeah. is essentially, uh, it's the same concept as Louis Simmons. So neural he calls uh, maximal effort day. So this is your opportunity to go heavy. I put heavy inverted commas. You can't see it, but I did that little yeah. sign. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going heavy because it depends on the tempo and the type of lift because some of the variations in there you're not going to be able to go heavy as a you know compared to your one arm mm -hmm. um, the imc day is your speed or dynamic day and that's where we're trying to uh, look at increasing we're trying to train speed okay we're trying to improve your speed you can't improve your speed unless you go faster um, you can't just lift heavy what i find is again i didn't mention this at the beginning but if people grind reps and they go heavy all the time, their body actually gets used to lifting at that speed. Okay, you want to train their body to lift faster. We spoke about going through the gears in the article. Mm -hmm. um, you need to train rate of force development and speed strength to help maximal strength. So you've got to train first gear, second gear, to have a better third gear. Um, but they're split into two days like that. They both have assistance work. You can squat heavy on the deadlift day, the neural deadlift day if you wanted to. You could even do speed, speed squats on the other day. Um, but I mean, most of that's arbitrary. It's kind of like, it's, it depends on what equipment you have available. If I could assess a person, they would have specific posterior chain movements as opposed to uh, the ones I put in. The, the exercises in both days looked very similar from the outside, but it was the, the focus is, I think what you're saying is yeah. the, the attention on the two yeah. different days. So. Yeah, heavy okay. one day, speed the next. How long's the program? 12 weeks. 12 weeks. You could mm -hmm. run it for three week phases. Mm -hmm. I think I gave this, I don't know if I wrote in there, but some people are quite good at adapting to two week phases. And a lot of my clients, that's the way I train them. Um, and it's not just because I have high level clients. I do this with general pop clients. My belief is the general pop or a new client for one year, probably three week phases, then you should be doing two week phases with them. They should understand, uh, you know, what percentage they need to lift within that workout based on the reps, tempos and everything involved. But the two week phases is based around week one, you know, have an RPE, a rate of perceived exertion of seven, eight out of 10. Leave a little bit in the tank. Week two is where you go all out at a nine, 10 out of 10. Mm -hmm. And then obviously that's the end of that phase, you move on, you do this, you repeat the same process. If you're doing three week phases, maybe the first week is a six or seven out of 10 effort the next week's a little bit more, seven, eight out of 10, and then the third week is is all out. Okay, and that's something you perhaps adapt with the, the training maturity of the, the athlete. That it's exactly have. that, it's exactly that. Um, some people just, they, they either don't know what weights to lift uh, based on speed of the bar, or they, they mispick a weight during one week, which is why a big thing I do with my clients is I help them 
select weights. I don't use percentages because it's it's too awkward. Um, but weight selection is is, is a big thing. Um, even if you went two week phases and you went five out of ten, but you lift the bar with maximal effort, you still get a strength response. Another thing people forget is you doesn't you don't have to put heavy weight on the bar. The intent on the bar can be as important as the weight lifted. So you could go five out of ten effort week one, as long as you put maximal intent on the bar, which will be meaning it'll be moving quite quickly even on the neural days. Then it doesn't matter. You can ramp up and go as heavy as you like the next week. You've still got a marker that you've done. You've laid down that marker in the first week. Week two, boom, game time. Excellent. Anything else I should consider? For deadlifting? Yeah. What sort <laughs> um, of things should I be doing around it? Um, I suppose if you looked at your upper body work, because the deadlift is from your fingertips all the way down. If your grip's weak and you're in powerlifting, then you need to look at grip work. Uh, one of the biggest tips I got off Andy Bolton was to do shrugs. Andy's coming down soon as well, February 23rd. If you can get in a room with Andy and or just have buy a coaching session with him, he is so good. You don't get many world record, we're talking best ever guys. You don't get many best ever who can actually coach as well. He's so good. He's full of little tips and tricks and, and cues. Um, but one of the things he said was, you know, you want to shrug. And it wasn't a case of shrug with a tempo. You might build up to it. But it was shrug quickly and heavy. And that was the biggest thing that helped him improve his grip. Because if you think of a shrug, and we're talking a guy that can probably shrug 300 kilos for 12 reps, double overhand. I don't know. He's a strong guy. But it was a case of, he didn't have to go so heavy because he'd shrug up. And then as he came down, he'd have a quick turnaround from the, the eccentric into the concentric again which is the amortization phase. Because that's quick, the bar wants to pull your hand away as you turn up and down and up and down. So he's almost bouncing these shrugs, but it's working his grip because he's using a double overhand, mm -hmm. not a hook grip. So he's, not tucking, he's, not, he's not tucking his thumbs. He's working a pure double overhand grip. So that's one of the best things. So if you've got a weak grip, or even if you, 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 even if you don't have a weak grip, just doing some grip work could be a benefit. There is definite potentiation effect of doing double overhand axle work. So a two inch thick bar, uh, transferring to a, a normal barbell, normal, normal diameter barbell, 29 millimeter uh, barbell. You could look at training your lats more because again, the first thing that happens in a deadlift is your shoulders round or get pulled forward. If you slow-mo anybody's deadlift, their shoulders move. If you look from the side, their shoulders will round forward and then all of a sudden they contract back, which is the lats uh, being extended into an eccentric contraction, which is another reason I like uh, heavy uh, and the eccentric only work for the lats. Uh, same thing happens with your lower trap. It gets pulled out and comes back in. So lower trap work, trap three raises uh, can be a benefit. It's a funny thing, I've had people come in and their lower trap doesn't fire and is weak. Or well, it's, it's, it's gonna be weak if it doesn't fire. So the best way to get it firing is to use either hypervolt on it, um, acupoints, points, and obviously train it with the full range. I've had people who have lower back pain because their lower back or the mid back pain Lower back is strong, upper back is strong, mid back is not firing at all. Okay. And I've literally gone, again, gotten to come in two, three sets of bilateral trap three raises and their back pain's gone. So if you think about it, if you've got a strong lower back and a strong upper back, but the mid back's nowhere near where it needs to be or isn't firing, your kinetic chain is now breaking down the mm -hmm. middle of the back. So sometimes your body will go and give you a pain signal to say, stop fucking doing that because <laughs> it's not gonna work. Um, so just strengthening up your lower traps, yeah. which is is so commonly weak uh, in people, can be a huge benefit to the deadlift as well. The the chin up that we talked about last week, beneficial. Yeah, yeah, you could do that on a different day. The, the, you know, it's it's not the right, not the same pull, but you could definitely equate uh, pull ups, sh shoulder width and wide grip, so pronated grip, uh, would definitely transfer well to the deadlift. Mm. I uh, talked a little bit about grip and improving grip and different size bars. Straps, what's your views on, on those? So if you're, if you're general pop, use straps. The reason being is you're only as strong as your weakest link. Your grip is going to give up way sooner. I had it in a strongman seminar recently. A guy was saying, you know, why is the hook, is the hook grip stronger? And I was like, well, he did a double overhand deadlift at 160 and it slipped out of his hands. 
he went to either hook grip or mix grip, I think it was mix grip, and he managed to lift it. So for me, straps all the time, as opposed to mixed grip, where you turn uh, one hand would be pronated and one hand would be supinated, that's a mixed grip. Mm -hmm. I don't like mixed grip unless you're a power lifter, uh, and I, even then I don't like it, I prefer them to do hook grip over a long term. The reason being is when you've got a mixed grip, you have a torque on the bar, which then affects uh, a torque on your spine. Mm -hmm. I've seen guys with very long-term injuries. And again, you can overcome it. You can switch. You can do one way and then the other way. But my, if you look at the trend now, everyone uses, or majority of people are now using hook grip uh, for that. So general pop, I want them to use straps because I don't want them to use a mixed grip because I don't want them to develop an injury in a bad motor pattern later on. Also, if you use straps, you'll be able to use more weight. If you don't use straps and your grip's going on the sixth rep when you could have overloaded it. Like, you, do you want to train your grip or do you want to train the deadlift? If you want to train the deadlift, use straps. Straps are obviously pre prevalent in strongman. Um, some federations now don't like the figure eight straps, so you should get good at using the other straps. It's just some people are pernickety. Um, so straps are allowed in strongman, although mm. you will get, I have two clients training for England's Strongest Man currently, and their deadlift is without straps because uh, Glenn Ross likes to use different things. It's actually a good thing because it's early on in the season. It means they haven't got, to, haven't got to go crazy heavy. So using the straps to, to help you increase the, the lift, but at the same time doing a lot of grip movement and yeah. grip work to really get it to the state it needs to yeah, be. Yeah, I'm of the belief that your grip can't be too strong. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't, I don't see people with too strong a grip and develop injuries. I see people with too strong a chest and weak external rotators, but your grip just can't be it just can't be too strong. Yeah. Okay. We're at the end of the blog. Anything else you can think of that you'd like to to share with us? Oh, what is, did we miss anything? I think we covered everything. Yeah, I think we've covered most things. So, thank you very much again, Tom. Look Cheers, forward Jeff, to the next one. As do I. Have a great fun. <laughs>